In the last episode, we shared a conversation I recently had with Jesse Enkamp, AKA The Karate Nerd. Now he reached out to me and we talked about our YouTube journeys and how we establish our channels. And in this episode today, we're gonna to share our experiences in stepping outside the boundaries of our own arts and how we explore the expansive world of martial arts, both traditional and contemporary mixed martial arts. I have a question for you. So yeah. Is with your brother, so, so you, you grew up pretty much doing a lot of traditional karate training, correct? Yes. So your brother's now in MMA. Is there a lot of um, overlapping and not clashing, but like, how do you guys view each other's arts? Like, how do you find that like middle ground to mix? Because you're doing a lot more videos together, which I think is fantastic. So how is that dynamic working between you? Yeah, well, it's actually, it's interesting. Hmm. I think we, we learn a lot from each other. And we also respect the fact that we both chose different paths but we understand that there are differences and similarities. And once you have that mutual respect, then you can work together. But if, you know, when we were kids, we were always fighting and we can't do that now because <laughs> one will end up in the cemetery and one will be in the hospital <laughs> or in jail, <laughs> right? But, but what I love, because I love learning, right? Is when I see Oliver doing MMA, I learn so much about karate because he's doing a lot of what I consider are practical applications of traditional karate techniques that have perhaps never been pressure tested until MMA became a thing, right? And I can then try to deconstruct those techniques and do them in thin air and suddenly it looks like a kata. So I've been doing many of those techniques without even knowing it since I was a kid, right? But he mm -hmm. will also discover, yeah, this, this actually is that kata technique that we did as kids, right? And he didn't even know it because karate has perhaps, I don't know if it's ever been pressure tested in the way that an MMA fighter tests his skills on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes I, I join him in his classes and just, you know, watch him train or, or film him. And sometimes he helps me with karate classes or seminars. So we still share a lot of knowledge and techniques with each other, but obviously he's at a much higher level as a fighter than I will ever be. And, and I do my more nerdy karate, kabuto, Okinawa stuff. That, <laughs> He sometimes pretends to be interested in, but I can sense that he, he wants something else sometimes. But I think we get along pretty well. Maybe because we had our battles when we were younger. So now, you know, we're more mature. Yeah. But, but it's fun to see a different perspective because sometimes I, I, I want more of that um, rough kind of practical application and fighting stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I can get that. But then, uh, and some days maybe he wants some of the more... Um, traditional aspects and then he can get that mm -hmm. because it's a lot to be a professional fighter and, and just grinding and wrestling every day it's it's tough and so i think that we complement each other very well so i wish everybody could have a, a training partner and a brother like that that's amazing and especially you're talking about pressure testing yeah. you're not just pressure testing it in a competition but now you're pressure testing it against pieces of other arts too so it's like you know somebody who trained karate you know one day might not have encountered you know techniques from other art or a exactly. boxing or something so that seeing that mixture together i think is fantastic and i love the video you guys did where you made your um the mma kata i thought that was oh, really really yeah. interesting yeah exactly yeah I mean, and i mean why not you you could do that and, and in my recent video when i went to thailand i did a, a thai boxing kata for instance i mean it's just the concept of kata i love it why not use it mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, see, so many people put down kata, but it's like, if you really look at it, there's so much value you can get out of it. I mean, yeah. people are like, oh, if you can't use it in the fight, it's no good. Well, I mean, there's ideas there and you, it, it's yeah. connective tissue. And, you yeah. know, I, I, I used, uh, I had a guy sneak up behind me, try to get a sucker punch on my kidney. And I actually ended up doing two steps of our kata. Just, just, it just happened. I'm like, ah, okay. Right. The ideas are there. So it's like- Muscle memory. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So I just wish people would kind of have that open minded and mindedness. And I think- like channels like yours are really good to showing because you've got two distinct worlds right there because you know yes. there's the mma side the traditional side they always clash but we see with you guys how well it can mesh and yes. how much is shared ideas and i think that message is very very important to put yeah. out there because there's just too much fighting on that and it's unnecessary yes and it's funny you brought that up because right now i'm working on a video where we switch lives for one day so uh -huh. oliver <laughs> tries out the karate nerd life and i try the pro fighter life for one day and I, I think that's actually a very fun video and i'm sure you're gonna enjoy that but you're right though because like you talked about you don't always you know you teach the seminar punch strike that language barrier comes into play and or if people are coming from different styles you know what, what makes sense in your art might not make sense to them so it's like you're right yeah. you got to keep that in mind and that is something to go into to kind of 
a lot of people don't realize that it's not just a one size fits all. Exactly. Especially if you've never uh, ventured outside of your own style before, you might think mm -hmm. that everybody does it the same way, but you know, even within the same style, you will have lots of variation. So it's kind of like if you grow up in a small town and you think the whole world is like your town, right? But once you start traveling and, and expanding your horizons, you will see that there are many ways of life, just like there are many ways of the martial arts. Yeah, a little bit of culture shock built into that if you're not prepared exactly. for it. Exactly. Yeah. When I started doing the jujitsu classes, yeah. it was such a culture shock for me because the stances are different. A lot of the concepts are different that kind of went against what I had previously learned. But there's so many times where we do a technique. I'm like, oh, we, we had this in Kempo. It was just yeah. called something else. Yeah. And you start to see that overlap. And like, I love it when people leave comments like, oh, well, if Taekwondo is so good, how come you don't see it in MMA? It's like, yeah. well, how come you don't see it? It's there. Do you not <laughs> exactly. see it? Yeah. How come you don't see it? Yeah, why don't we see karate? It's there. Yeah. <laughs> if we know what to look for, you can see that there's, you know, common roots in there. And, yes. and there are artists out there. I mean, some with so many great knockouts are taekwondo kicks. Yes. And it's for like sure. it's it's not just cage fighting. There's other disciplines. The whole thing is people are taking the best of what they've learned and they're making their own particular blend. And that's yeah. the artistry in it. And I think that's the fascinating part in it. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's, overall, I, I like the idea of, you know, let's take all these different arts for people and let's get rid of the debate of which one's better and see, well, where's, what's the best of all of them that you can combine? Like, what can you actually pull? What's exactly. the silver lining? What's the benefit from each art that you can pull? Because every art has something good in it somewhere. Is there any specific martial art you think that I should uh, explore next? Make it, what would be interesting to see me try? Well, from my perspective, have you tried Kempo, American Kempo? <laughs> right, right. So I, I experienced that sort of uh, with Sensei mm -hmm. Seth, but obviously I didn't take a real class. Yeah, we just compare them a little bit, but that would be interesting for sure. And there's also- Which Kempo? Huh? Is he American Kempo? Is he American Kempo or does he have a different version? Oh, there, so there's this whole thing about, <laughs> right, with uh, one with the M and one with the N, right? How you spell Well, there's it. a lot of, there's, yeah, well, that's the spelling, but there's a lot of schools because there's, there's like Shaolin Kempo, there's uh, uh, Hawaiian right. Kempo, Chinese Kempo, um, Ed Parker, specifically American Kempo. They're all completely different curriculums. Well, honestly, the only um, Kempo I've practiced is actually in Okinawa, and it was called Okinawan Kempo. So, so, and so that's, I haven't sure that's really experienced different. the different American ones, but there seems to be a lot of yeah. flavor. The, yeah, there's a lot of flavors. And even, even within the American, there's a lot of politics and splits within the American yes. system, so there's yeah. different ones. But um, Kempo's kind of hard. You got to find the right school. There's a lot. I hate to say it, but there's a lot of big dojos that are Kempo schools I mean, here with, in America. It's the same with all karate, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, but when you find the right Kempo school, because there's, Kempo's got this misconception to it. They're like, people, people look at it like, oh, you're doing a 20 step se self-defense sequence. Well, that's never going to work. They're never going to stand there. It's like, well, no, we don't expect them to stand there. But this is, our techniques are almost kind of like mini katas. So you got to like, yeah. Look at the situation and there's like a, probably a dozen different principles and ideas that you got to pull out and see how they apply. You're not meant to copy and paste these. This, you wouldn't take a kata and do a whole sequence out in the street for oh. self-defense, but oh. you would take what you learn from it. Exactly. So, but it's not a lot of it's an exercise. It teaches you. Something. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's the analogy I use. This is my favorite analogy is I use the martial arts like a language and Kempo is a good, I, a good way to look at if you're learning a brand new foreign language. So you have your basics, you know, your kihon, which is the vocabulary. Those are the words. You learn how to pronounce the words correctly. You learn how to spell them. You learn how to use them. Then you've got your grammar, which is all your principles, your rules. And, and then when you take your grammar and your, your vocabulary, you put them together, you start to learn how to make sentences. So with Kempo, you learn your basics. And then you learn your different principles. You know how, you know, our power principles, you know, gravitational marriage and all that. And then our self-defense techniques are basically sentences, but they're like, if you're learning the language, they're a sample sentence. You're just seeing yeah. an example how the grammar and vocabulary work together so that once you understand that, you can make your own sentences for a conversation for you to have later, a freestyle mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. And a lot of people think it's just, oh, well, those techniques won't work. Well, what they do if, if they're taught correctly, one, there's a lot of schools that don't teach it that way, which is yeah. very unfortunate. Mm. But I, my first instructor did that. He just taught us how to memorize it and go through it. We didn't really break it down. My second instructor showed me, he's like, first, slow down. He goes, you're doing a ton of hits. He goes, but do you even know what each hit is doing? And he broke it down. And every day we came in, he's like, okay, we're doing this technique this way now. He would change the curriculum constantly. But what that did though was I realized, okay, it's not set in stone. The ideas are the yeah. same. He's just changing the order. He's changing the application. Oh, he's bringing MMA into the mix. So now we're going from this technique that used to have 20 sequences. It's got two and it goes through a double leg takedown. So he actually yeah. kind of showed me how you break it apart like a Lego set and you can rebuild the bricks together to build something that you need based on what you want and how you know how pieces fit.
Mm, that that's, reminds that's, me. That's the analogy I like. I like that because actually when I practiced uh, Okinawan Kempo, uh, when I was in Okinawa, the teacher told me that there are uh, three ways of doing a technique. So he said, there is the way that you've been taught. That was the first way. And then there is the second way, which is the way that you do it for yourself based on your own um, mindset, body type and preference. And then there's the third way, which is the way you teach it. And they're not always necessarily the exact same. So there's a process, mm -hmm. there's an evolution always in the technical uh, aspects. So I like that idea at least. So there's not just one yeah. size fits all. And I think what you're saying too, the playoff that I think it feeds itself because if once you teach it, in a way, you start to learn it differently and you start to practice it differently. Yeah, exactly. Because I worked with kids for quite a few years teaching kids classes and sometimes taking a technique and breaking it down to the simplest level. There were so many times as I'm explaining to them, I go, oh, I never noticed that before. So <laughs> it kind of like enlightened me. I got these little light bulb moments. And, but yeah. of course, when I go back and practice, I'm now putting those new ideas in. So I think that's just kind of a self-feeding cycle, which yeah. helps us improve. Exactly. And that's why teaching is so important. It's like, it's, it's definitely... After practicing, it's the second best way to learn something. You just teach Absolutely. somebody else. And like I said previously, you don't even have to be an expert at it. Just teach it for yourself because you want to discover more and learn more and understand more about this technique. But a lot of people don't like that idea because they don't feel confident enough to teach. But uh, yeah. yeah, I taught mainly kids and I had an interesting experience again, right before the pandemic happened. Um, I was invited to teach at a Kempo seminar. And um, a good friend of mine was running the seminar. I'm like, sure, that'd be, that'd be great. And then I realized, I'm like, wait, you know, I've taught kids. I mean, I, I taught a couple of adult classes here and there, but they were years ago. You know, I'm still getting back into refreshing my own material. With the kids program, you know, we don't do the whole adult curriculum. I mean, you know, they get the first couple belt levels. So I knew that stuff real well. Yeah. But I realized the seminar, they were all black belts, not just first degree black belts, second, third, fourth, fifth. I'm like, what am I going to teach them? You know, yeah. like, and like you say, I'm kind of nervous. I'm like, this is not a basic class. I have to come yeah. up with something that's not just rudimentary that they already know, but I got to have, I have to give them something fresh. So yes. what I ended up doing was, you know, I've been training in judo and jujitsu for a couple of years. I'm like, why don't I, why don't I do a class based on my observations of how you can mix them? So I yeah. took a lot of the jujitsu moves and showed them how to transition from our Kempo techniques using the jujitsu moves nice. and put the blocks and the submissions and change it. And they seemed to get a kick out of that, but that was, a really interesting experience for me because I had that overwhelming sense yes. of like, uh oh, am I, am I qualified to do this? You yes. know, what are, do I have the knowledge for them? But I'm like, I, I don't want to teach at them, but let's find let's find something fun to explore. And yes. it worked out well, and I had a great time with that. But it's like you're, you're right. Sometimes you go and you're like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, like, what do you think would be interesting to see? I'm always trying to search for new topics or ideas. That's a good question. I like what you're doing right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're, no, I like how you're going to visit at North Carolina, actually, where your sensei moved. And uh, oh, really? something with, uh, I filmed them with, um, I, you know, Icy Mike. Yes. Yes. I filmed with him and Sensei Seth and Wonder Boy and all of them are kind of in the same area. So yeah, those seem to do pretty well when I travel around and meet people. Yeah, that seems because that's actually something we were getting ready to put together a series of videos right before the pandemic hit. We were going to yeah. be like, oh, let's do a day in the life of, and like go to like, because we're in an area, um, I'm in South Florida, so there's Miami, okay. there's Palm Beach. We have a lot of different martial arts around us. I mean, you can right. find different Chinese schools, Korean schools. I mean, there's there's BJJ, there's a whole mix. So like, yeah. why don't we do topics where we go visit, like let's take a, one class in the school, one class yeah. in that school and kind of do like a, a day in the life of, and we were just setting yeah. that up and then the pandemic hit and all the schools shut down. We're like, yeah. all right, we're putting that on the back burner. Yeah. But I like what you've done, um, your, your um, Muay Thai video. Oh, the, so the most I, recent one, you mean? Yeah. When I went yeah. to Thailand. So I like the idea. Yeah. And I think doing stuff like that, I, I find that very intriguing. When you step outside your box, you're like, oh, let me go yeah. try this. And then you yeah. work with them and inspire them. I love to see that, that I don't want to say clash, because it's not a clash, but you're taking two different worlds, putting them together. But I think it's great for the audience to see not only the similarities, but then the differences between the arts. But there's, you know, people don't realize there's a lot of overlap. And sometimes yeah. you have to mix stuff like that to see that overlap and people are like, okay, well maybe, you know, martial arts have more in common because there's too much out there of that, which art is better. Yeah. And I hate that yeah. debate because it's like, well, yeah. there's so many different shared roots. But the thing is you always have to frame it like, which martial art is the best? Let's compare Aikido versus karate or something like that. Of right? course. So on the surface, yeah. it looks like it's a, a, a conflict. But <laughs> once you look under the surface, you realize, oh, they actually have more in common than I thought because 
after all, we all have the same tool to work with, the human body, right? You know, the arm only bends this much, like there's only, only so many ways you can attack somebody <laughs> with a joint lock, for instance. Like, that's why I always want to see karate or, or all martial arts like a mountain, right? And there are many paths mm -hmm. that lead to the top. So meaning many different arts. And when you stand at the bottom of the mountain, they, they look so different, right? Because they're so far apart, but obviously they converge at the top. And essentially, you know, a master in one martial art will instantly recognize a master in another martial art because they're essentially the same because you move from technique to principle and principles are universal. That's why they're principles, right? So that's mm -hmm. the way I like to view it. And, and of course, there's also the whole idea behind cross training that sometimes you have to climb the mountain next to yours to see your own mountain better because it gives mm -hmm. you perspective. So these are the kind of the, the metaphors that I love to use when, when talking about these things. Such an incredible way to see the journey. And I think it's important that we take multiple perspectives into account if we want to grow as martial artists. Now, I'd like to extend an extreme thank you to Jesse Sensei for his effort and time in this discussion. And if you guys haven't already, please be sure to check out and visit and subscribe to his channel. And you can find a link to that in the description down below. There's a wealth of information over there. I'm sure you'll all enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching.